following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio, streaming, and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for navigating the madness of mental health using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This week, we're talking about connecting with other humans. Yeah, that prospect is terrifying for many of you, and that's why I've got one of my favorite people on the whole planet joining me as a guest actor, writer, filmmaker, online content creator, and a bunch of other things. Bobby Calloway will be joining us all the way from Ireland. And no, this is not because St. Patrick's Day just passed. That's complete coincidence. I'll spare you all the statistics on chronic loneliness and mental and physical health outcomes because uh, they're depressing. And if you're at all interested in that topic, you probably know them already. We know there's a loneliness epidemic. We know men are hit by it more than women, but that marriage has greater health benefits for men than women. And we're not going to get into the reasons why, because that would be the whole show. Moving on. Well, loneliness is getting worse. It's not a new thing. In 1972, only 45% of Americans said they felt that they could trust other Americans. By 2016, that number had dropped to 30%. The U.S. Surgeon General listed political polarization as the reason for the drop, but less than half back in the 70s was not a great number to begin with. The most isolated group in North America is apparently 15 to 24 year olds. Time spent in person with friends has dropped 70% since 2003. 40 minutes per day. 40 minutes per day is the average time a 15 to 24 year old spends socializing in person with their friends. That is down from 150 minutes in only 20 years. And those numbers, before, oh, the COVID pande pandemic, nope, nope. Those numbers were in decline before COVID. Now, the anecdotes I've heard from people in general and clients, they support those numbers. People are afraid to send their children to sleepovers because they might get molested. People are afraid to date because they might get assaulted, falsely accused of assault or scammed. And people are taught to see their peers as competitors, not just for spots on teams, colleges and companies, but also clout on social media. I hear almost weekly from someone who secretly doesn't like their friends, but they don't want to say anything for fear of someone making up lies about them or canceling them or something like this. In short, we're protecting and planning ourselves into misery. We're networking ourselves into nothingness. And this is something that's very hard about life because... We're all about playing to not lose. We're not about playing to win. But in order to really feel accepted, you have to risk rejection. If you only circulate in groups that are forced to put up with you, like many people do online and even in person, you can't feel like anyone really likes you. And if, if any of you are shaking your heads going, why would I go somewhere where people were forced to put up with me? It's amazing how many people show up to things where they know that a large number of people there don't want them there because you're not going to keep me away. You can't stop me. It's, it's a spiral downward. And yes, there's the long work hours, incompatible schedules, the sheer cost of going out when everyone lives in an apartment the size of a closet with four roommates. All of that is real. But I'm going to focus on what you can control, not the greater economy, because top 10 phrase, healthy goals are based on things you can control. You cannot connect with other people when you're terrified of other people. 
True friendships are rooted in common core values, compassionate honesty, and integrity. If you don't risk a little and show up for other people, you're not bringing anything to the table. But what if I get used is what I tend to hear. Top 10 phrase, don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are. If you set healthy boundaries early, you're only going to give what you're willing to give. It's not other people's fault if you do things you don't want to because you're people pleasing. Own your choices and things will go much better. If you're losing sleep to talk to your friend until 2 a.m., that is a choice. No one's forcing you. If you're partying instead of taking care of yourself, eating proper food and getting proper sleep, that is a choice. Own your choices. But if I don't do this thing, I'll get canceled, tends to be the next thing I hear. Real talk. Who cares if a group of people who don't respect your boundaries don't want you around? And if you care, why? Top 10 phrase, people don't have to like your boundaries. They do have to respect them. Now, that's not a rhetorical question. I ask clients things like that, and they think it's a rhetorical question. And like, ah, you're right. I should have said, no, no, no. No, should. Why are you doing this? People don't do these things for no reason. You have the right to reject people who don't respect your boundaries. That's not mean. And it's not abuse. If your boundaries aren't being respected, that is abuse. But some people come from families of origin where boundaries are routinely violated. I have a friend who, you know, they they don't have any private space. They still live with family and family goes in and goes through their stuff and throws out their stuff and they there's no boundaries there's no boundaries and that's normal for them so again why do you care there are probably reasons even if you think you shouldn't care you're not going to be able to force yourself to not care you have to explore those reasons y- yeah If you set boundaries, you might get slandered in a group of kind of bad to horrible people. Did you listen to last week's show? Yeah, I hope you did. It, whoo, roller coaster, right? I've talked about the experiences I've had getting slandered by kind of bad to horrible people. Sometimes you're judged by the caliber of your enemies. If you have really good enemies, then, you know, you're doing something right. If you're squirming, At this point, again, the therapy might be an option here. There might be some trauma, some unresolved issues that result in a possibly unhealthy need to be liked by either the wrong people or all people. Because people pleasing doesn't help you feel like you belong. Here's the other tough part about that. Would would you would you realize, yes, I'm people pleasing, I'm doing it so people don't leave me, I'm I'm doing it to manipulate people. Yeah. You have to face the fact that other people have the right to reject you just like you have the right to reject other people. It's not always fair. It's not always for good reasons. But sometimes it is. Sometimes you deserve it. The only thing you can control in social interactions is whether you're being fair, accountable, present, and behaving with integrity. I've said integrity twice. It's a buzzword with billionaires now, and I kind of hate it because it's... I, I read it first about Warren Buffett, and then Elon Musk dropped that word really manipulatively and uh, oh he read it somewhere Warren Buffett thinks it's good that man has no idea what integrity is because integrity means living in accordance with your core values admitting when you're wrong instead of being stubborn and digging in and if Elon Musk could do that he wouldn't have canceled Don Lemon off of X after an interview that clearly did not go the way Elon Musk wanted integrity means giving people a chance without completely 
dropping your defenses. It means self-awareness. It means self-control. And I'm making this sound really not fun, aren't I? Yeah, it can be tough. I'm going through a period right now where I am choking on the self-control. I just want to scream sometimes, but I can't. I can't because not worth it. It can be tough. But without integrity, without that sense of self, without the self-compassion that leads to self-worth, that leads to self-esteem, you lose yourself. And a connection requires you to know yourself, to have yourself, because a connection between two people requires one anchor in you and the other anchor in the other person. If either person is lacking in that self-awareness, self-compassion, self-worth, self-esteem, those anchors get weak. And it results in somebody not taking responsibility and blaming the other person for things that aren't their fault, somebody else taking on too much so that the person can never, you know, be there for the person, really be there. More on that in a bit. Uh, You know what? I've been talking for a while. Let's go to a break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about one of my absolute, and two, one of my absolute favorite people in the world. Bobby Calloway, writer, actor, video essayist, pop culture analyst, filmmaker, all around amazing person. I forget all the cool things Bobby does because he's just so awesome as a dude. Anyway, Bobby Calloway will be joining me to talk about his challenges and successes connecting with other people, not just in the real world, but also through his work. Question, comments, concerns, Leanna at NotTherapyShow.com, NotTherapyShow.com. If you can't remember all that, forget how to spell my name, fill out the contact form on NotTherapyShow.com. Join our mailing list while you're there at NotTherapyShow on X, that's Twitter, Instagram, and threads. We will be right back talking human connections on It's Not Therapy. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's the Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kirsten. I'm still not a therapist. We're still talking making and maintaining human connections. And I'm really stoked for the interview this time because it's a friend of mine all the way from Ireland. A lot of Irish guests on It's Not Therapy lately. I've got my friend and actor, pop culture, video essayist, author, screenwriter. He wears a lot of hats. Bobby Calloway, welcome to It's Not Therapy. Well, um, I'm sorry. I'm just really starstruck because it's usually me interviewing you. So I'm usually the one who has to come up with the the big sort of intros to hype up how awesome the guest is. So it's I'm I'm feeling a little um, overwhelmed with how lovely you just were to me there. It's the most terrifying part of any interview for me. If I really? can get through that without a stumble, I know it's going to be good. Oh, I, I can do a one on one interview. No problem. But that intro, it's like the momentum. Right. It's like the beginning of the roller coaster. You have to get it smooth or it's like, oh, disappoint. Right. When you're going into the interview. Right. But when we were talking about what to talk about bringing you on, because you are you're a joy to talk to. You're one of the most positive people I know. And yet you secretly struggle with feeling included feeling like people want you around. So I thought you would be a good guest to bring on here and. Uh, tell tell the listeners what you told me about the desire you fight to pull away from people. Um, I mean, um, obviously I saw, you know, we all know the film Goodwill Hunting, you know, I mean, I saw it years ago and kind of recently enough, um, you know, one of the quotes just sort of came up in my news feed about how uh, Will basically pushes people away and he rejects them before they have a chance to reject him. And I read that, I was like, oh Jesus, that is me. That's a lot of people, right? I mean, rejection hurts. We talk a lot about how rejection registers in the brain as physical pain. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're an actor, you're a screenwriter, you're an author. You have to submit things for 
you know, consideration and more often than not rejection. So why is it different when it's people? Uh, I guess, um, yeah. Well, I mean, the way I coped with uh, rejection as an actor, um, uh, I always the scenario I used was like, you know, say you're going to a toy shop to get a Christmas present. And, you know, you want to I mean, if you're like me, when I was in a toy shop as a kid, I wanted to leave with everything in there. You know, everything is great in there. You know, it's a wondrous place. And that's kind of the same with acting as well, like because the majority of the time, you know, everyone auditioning is a good actor. You know, any one of them could do it. Mm -hmm. could do the role well but it's like and by rejecting every other applicant except this one person right it doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad it's just you know they're not what you're looking for so that's kind of the the kind of the the thing there right and um i suppose and i kind of i guess society sort of um there is this sort of belief i don't know if it teaches us this or we internalize it but um sort of um it's the message that it's your own fault if you get rejected like oh it's your fault for not being yeah. good enough and everything yeah as yeah. opposed to okay well we didn't click you know just have a nice life we didn't work out or whatever so it can sometimes feel that because that's why a lot of people sort of stay in um like friendships and romantic relationships for way longer than they should have because they think oh if we can make this work then you know we haven't failed or whatever right yeah it the fact that just not being besties with everybody you encounter, I, I've I've found that that it people talk about being lonely, and yet they don't strike up conversations. The fear of being rejected is worse than the fear of being lonely, and I realized it's just the sheer number of people I encounter because of my job that saves me from that. I don't have time to think about you know that that author or you know therapist i follow on twitter who i think is the greatest thing in the world or a game developer who i emailed to be on the program and they didn't ever write me back they couldn't even bother to respond it was just nothing i don't have time to think about that most of the time because i'm on to the next thing mm. and people especially now post covid don't have the opportunity to do that and you had an experience fairly recently didn't you where you thought about pulling away and you didn't and and you're glad for it is that correct uh yeah um many many experiences yeah um i suppose should we go in chronological order then yeah just give people some some examples because i admit i was really surprised to hear you struggle with this you you mask well in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, I I don't know what it is. It's not a lack of confidence. It's just more of a lack in faith in humanity, maybe. I don't know. I suppose uh, I think it might be just sort of, you know, not wanting to feel bad. Right. And I, I think that's a that's a really simple but completely understandable way of summing it up nobody wants to feel bad and there's too many bad feelings out there right now so how do you approach it when you get a funny vibe off of someone you think they're pulling away or they think you they don't like you those alarm bells go off in your head how how do you well what do you do there um yeah usually just um I actually will actively stop myself from messaging them like I used to, because basically I'm kind of a very isolated in terms of location from everyone. Like it's you're just a writer, kind of, yeah, yeah. It's I just all my friends tend to live really far away from me. You know, it's usually just meeting up is like a <laughs> it's like several months worth of planning to even it's get the, like one afternoon free. Yeah, uh... it's the three hour tour from Gilligan's Island. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, haven't I haven't watched but I, I trust your judgment showing my age you see the smoothness there folks I haven't watched but I trust your judgment instead of that was before my time thank you for that Bobby Calloway now that you've exhibited your charm please go on <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah so I would just avoid messaging people or um, I would just you know sort of uh, fight the urge to talk to them or even like in interact with their posts a lot and mm -hmm. kind of uh just i basically overthink way too much and kind of um but like i'm getting better at that because i have this really great peer counselor who has helped me so much 
Gee, who could that be? Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm glad that was helpful because that that's something I have to get over the desire to not bother people. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah and the thing that, that was always my default, like, uh, oh, I'm bothering someone by simply yeah. being in their life. Yeah. And the thing that got me over that is working with people, you know, like yourself who said, I wish people would contact me for a change. And hearing that so often, I thought, well, OK, so many people want this that if I do this and someone finds it irritating, well, that's on them, not me. And I guess that's what you were speaking to earlier, that it's not my fault if someone reacts badly, as opposed to it being something that I have to correct to. Would you agree? Yeah. And there's also sort of, uh, I guess, uh, I'm not sure about the Canadians, but um, Irish, uh, we're, we're taught we have to be humble. We have to like, you yeah. know, like always put ourselves down yeah. and like if someone compliments us we're just like oh, yeah sure whatever and so i tend to sort of like you know there's people there are people who have had like such profound impacts on my life and i would never think of hey maybe i've had an impact on them and i had um this is this will be the first shout out of of the show where uh it's a ac wonderful actor i know called uh luke anthony jr a great uh liverpudlian actor but so talented like he can disguise his voice you wouldn't even know where he was from if he if he really wanted to fool you and we um i got to know him 2017 you know actors tend to sort of like post their reels online you know like hey look at me this is what i can do and i just i saw his reel like kind of added him on every single social network there was and was like you have no idea who i am but i have seen your reel and you are just fantastic and kind of just um never left him alone just like luke you are so good you know all this and he's, he's a very sweet guy as well and kind of recently uh, me and him just ended up it's funny that we had a talk that opened with me trolling him like I usually do mm -hmm. and then it moved into a really deep talk and we ended up having a zoom call and during the call like his brother walked into the room and uh, Luke was just like oh you want to say hi and he's like oh this is the man himself and I'm just like what and like uh, Luke had basically told him all about me and he's like oh I've seen your reel I've heard all about how great you are as well and I'm just like it, I just didn't consider the fact that um, this guy would tell his family about the fact that he has an actor friend who just uh loves his loves his work and will never not shut up about it so it was it was very nice to know that i had that impact on someone i think actors are acutely aware anybody in the media is acutely aware of there isn't enough compliments mm -hmm. in the world i'm really messing up my singulars versus plurals this interview blah blah there aren't enough compliments in the world and i think we all go out of our way when we are sincerely uh, big on something to share it because mm -hmm. it, there there is a risk in saying something's good right i mean reaching out yeah and saying, you on the defensive. well i think this is amazing it's vulnerable because somebody can come by and tell you all the reasons it's terrible and one of the things i love about your content is you don't do the typical, oh, here's why Poor Things is brilliant, or here's why Oppenheimer is the, the best movie ever. It's stuff like the movie Van Helsing and Snow White and the Huntsman. And one of my favorites as a kid, and I thought I was alone in this one, not quite a kid, but Charmed, the old Shannon Doherty, Holly Marie Combs, uh, Alyssa Milano, Rose McGowan show. And I always liked that show better than Buffy. But it got no love. In fact, it got a lot of derision at the time. And you've done very, very well in your YouTube content going through these shows. You did one episode of uh, it's Better With Bob is the name of your YouTube channel, correct? Yeah. Yeah. About the emotional, like healthy emotions in Charmed. And you, you quoted me and I'm like, oh, he's learned so well. Uh, but what? How how do we bottle that, the ability to unabashedly say, I like this thing that is, quote unquote, just entertainment? Because there's no cloud in it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess um, I kind of, because um, in the 2000s, we sort of saw the rise of like, you know, the bad faith criticism, like mm -hmm. Channel Awesome and like all the stuff on Cracked.com about uh, 
plot holes and all this sort of thing. And it almost felt as though there was a narrative set, like the internet says, this thing is bad and it's a strike against your character if you like it. And yeah. rather than, you know, kind of promoting differing opinions, it was sort of just like, um, you know, you were, you're a good person if you like this, you're a bad person if you like that. And um, I just, uh, I just felt like um, we just... I actually think this was uh, something you said that inspired me. Well, there are many things you say that inspire me, but um, um, you the idea of promoting different voices, you know, that uh, we can mm -hmm. we can disagree healthily, you know, and it's just one person's opinion is just as valid as the other person's. And I just kind of, I sort of like giving a voice to people who maybe might have been afraid to say this thing was good because um, I was pretty afraid to defend Charmed at first, but then once I kind of, uh, well, thankfully I was a little more mature by the time I finally started doing it, but um, I just, once I got into the swing of it, I was just like, no, this stuff is good. I stand by this, you know? And it doesn't mean you have to be like, you know, oh, this thing is amazing, like no flaws, no notes mm -hmm. or whatever. It's like, you can interact with it critically and like, like, okay, this didn't work for me, but like overall this thing did. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I want to, you know, come out with because um this year um it's the 20 year anniversary of uh, a lot of uh remember in 2004 we had this trend of like these big historical epics like yeah. you know, troy king yeah. arthur and kingdom of heaven and um i always liked troy it's a very divisive movie and uh, i kind of watched it back i was like no there's a lot in this that should be praised so i'm planning on doing a exhaustive series of video essays on those films oh the cinematography was spectacular i didn't know how they managed to do no upskirt shots on brad pitt while he was doing all those jumps <laughs> I, mean, I, I suspect there was some camera trickery involved there well apparently because the production was got delayed because uh, a hurricane destroyed the set and that's he right it. He tore his Achilles tendon, so they were filled. Ironic, film in that's December. right. Irony, irony. He tore his Achilles tendon. So they had to film in December, and basically the CGI budget was spent like erasing the long shadows. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's uh, that's the thing when you make stuff. I mean, we've talked quite a bit about how feature films are very difficult to make. So many things can go wrong. So very little goes right. And I think once you make stuff yourself, you realize, you yeah, yeah, you realize how much work goes into it and you realize how much luck goes into it. And you're sort of good job. You got it made, you know, mm -hmm. even if you may not like the person much, you recognize that they got it out the door. They got it finished. And how obviously that's a process. It's a process of maturing. But I think part of the reason we do it is it makes us feel better as well as, you know, being, being kinder uh, to me, kindness, being authentically positive is something I do for myself. Actually, Bobby, that's probably a good place to take a break. Oh God, I've been real rough on the segues to break this show. Yikes. But we'll be back with Bobby Calloway, actor, filmmaker, online content creator, great dude, my friend, uh, after the break, talking human connections. Um, not therapyshow.com if you want to send a question, comment, concerns, anything like that. We'll be back more with Bobby Calloway and Human Connections after this. The following program is a peer to peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. And it's a therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. I'm still talking to my friend, actor, filmmaker, online content creator, writer, all that stuff, Bobby Calloway, all the way from Ireland. And before the break, we were talking about human connections and specifically putting positives out there, being authentically positive. What's your approach to psyching yourself up that way? I guess it's just... Um... I have to remind myself of the times when I did that and it did have good results. You know, generally it's like nine times out of 10, it does have good results. And I can kind of, if you want, I can kind of go into that long winded yeah. story I prepped you with beforehand, right? Yeah, yeah, go okay. for it. Yeah, so um, Cliff Notes version on my uh, 
friend Richie's podcast, Talk is Rich, last year. I kind of talked in length about this, and you can check it out if you want to get the full story. But I'll just say, early 2022, I had a pretty bad breakdown. It was um, just like a whole lot of stuff was finally catching up with me, and it was what kind of sought me to finally uh, uh, hook up with uh, Liana for um, Liana Kerr's sessions, which, lifesaver. And kind of, um, um, I was in a state where I was, I wasn't quite a hermit, you know, I mean, I could, I could leave my house to go to the shop and kind of all that sort of things. But like, um, I was in such a bad state, like, I would have panic attacks going on the train to travel places. And like, I could, it was a, a putting my own socks on in the morning was a, a very big challenge mm -hmm. for me, you know, mm -hmm. trauma brain, I'm sure you know, all too well. And uh, kind of my only lifelines became um, Le my Liana Kerr sessions and uh, this barbershop I went to. And I went to, I'd kind of gone to like a bunch of different places on and off. And I made this my regular place because one guy there in particular was really nice to me on days where I really needed it. And um, I, again, I had um, such huge imposter syndrome. Like I was just like, oh, I'm not cool enough to, to be in this place. I don't deserve mm. to be to be here or whatever. And, um, but I just kind of remember this guy being, being so nice to me and me going there, just like, okay, this is a person's energy who I love, just mm -hmm. keep going. And the way I kind of fought with the anxiety was to try and just make friends with everyone there. And that basically sort of, I was eventually going there every two weeks. And even though I was super nervous, like, um, and like I was having panic attacks, like before every visit, like it was kind of one of the only things I had to look forward to. And um, I always, and again, trauma brain at the time, I always, like, I can never tell, like, uh, is the difference between someone being paid to be nice to me and someone who right. actually likes me as a person. Right, so I, right. I, I never let on that these guys were doing that for me. Like, I was always keeping it very, very separate, like trying, again, trying not to talk to them too much online, trying not to bother them, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. E even though they were all very nice and very supportive and like, they would like things that I posted, you know, my acting stuff. And then, um, uh, yeah, about a year ago now, actually, a couple, in a few weeks, will be a couple of years. Sorry, random. Sorry, I, <laughs> I forgot how to speak. But yeah, a year ago, basically, um, that guy, the original guy who was nice to me, it's, not, it's nuts. I kind of, I feel like I have to not say his name to protect his privacy. But right. like I, he said, you can attach my name to anything you want, Bobby. So I still don't know what to say. <laughs> But um, yeah, him and uh, another guy who meant a lot to me as well, they left that shop and I was actually devastated. Yeah, you, know? you were. And um, uh, I had a, the sort of like, oh, F it. Oh, can you curse on this or should I censor myself? We bleep it. Okay. That's why okay. we pre-record. Yeah. Okay. Um, F this, you know, probably never going to see these guys again. So I kind of sent a big, long thank you messages kind of like, saying what was happening. Like, hey, I was going through a really tough time. You were mm. really nice to me. And that guy's response kind of made me cry uncontrollably for uh, pretty much a whole day. And I was feeling really bad about it. And I felt so stupid for like reaching out and getting vulnerable. It was like, oh, me trauma dumping over this poor guy who's like cut my hair four times in the space of two years. And, and, um, but then of course, knowing my luck, not two hours after me sending these messages, like, uh, oh yeah, never going to see these guys again. They uh, announced that they're, working in a new shop five minutes down the road from the old one. Oh. And and uh, I knew then that I would um, work up the courage to go visit them, but it took me about three months to finally mm -hmm. do that because, again, like the fact I'd kind of gotten that vulnerable and kind of, you know, again, gotten that raw and, and that just made me feel really ashamed and really stupid. And I got so in my head about it and... I, I mean, you remember how kind of miserable I was. Like, I was still yeah. trying to, you know, move on and live my life or whatever and be like, hey, you know, when one door closes, another one opens, no big deal. And then, um, and actually, uh, one of my friends uh, could see how bad I was. And he says like, hey, do you want me to come down, stay with you so we can go in together? So, mm -hmm. you know, that might alleviate your anxiety. But he's, this is May, he says this. And he says like, I'm probably not going to be free until August. And I was like, okay, I can't wait that long. So one day I just... Uh, I just kind of had run out of reasons and I worked up the courage to go there. And Liana Kersner, I have um I have been to the top of Ayers Rock. I've mm -hmm. scuba dived the Great Barrier Reef. I have abseiled off the side of Croke Park Stadium and I've performed on stage. And I do not think I have been more terrified yeah. walking up to that shop and finally facing this guy. 
And but um, I'm an overthinker, and I like to sort of like plan scenarios in my head, like worst case scenarios and everything. But like you could not have you could not have written this because um, I mean I. I there was no one else in the shop, like a client just left and I walked in and said hi. And within a couple of seconds, I just knew I'd made the right decision. And it mm. was like, um, I, I will probably start crying if I talk too much about it. But I just, mm. you know, the whole time I was just like, I forgot how much I just love this guy, you know, mm. and just I made sure that I was kind of savoring the moment and just like, OK, be completely present. OK, just don't overthink. Don't just be there and savor it you know mm. and um i don't even remember saying you know um beforehand like if i ever saw him again i'd say this one quote that i know is like that one definition of success is to know that another life has lived easier because you yourself have lived mm -hmm. and i mean he was just great like even when even when we were saying goodbye like he just pulled out a loyalty card for the shop and like crossed out like six slots oh. <laughs> and um after and after i left i just found myself just crying as i was walking because i was just like i Again, I just forgot yeah. like how much I loved him and how much, and it, became, it was pretty much re a regular thing about um, uh, for the next few minutes. Like every time I left the shop, I would just start crying because he was just so good to me. And there's another guy who I don't, I didn't get the chance to talk about him too much in my talk as Rich interview, but he he means a lot to me as well. It's funny. I nicknamed him Bumblebee because one day <laughs> he, I was texting him and his name auto corrected to that. Oh, that's um, funny. And um, yeah, he was even before um, we properly met in the previous shop, you know, we were, I followed him online and he would like like things I posted. And I think he shared a couple of them as well. And mm -hmm. I really appreciated that because like, um, what am I trying to say? It's like he didn't need to do that. And it was very supportive. And in my my trauma brain, like setting goals for my recovery, one of my goals was you got to say hi to this guy. got to say hi to this young guy. And it took me about, I think, five visits to finally work up the courage to say hi. That's important then, to do. Yeah. And once I did and finally got to know him, I was like, no, you are definitely worth the wait. And uh, there was a, mo a very wholesome moment in the, the new shop when I felt... Because it was a while before I reunited with him. Like, I think it was... I went eight months without seeing him just like because we weren't in the same days mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> this was a moment that's kind of so narratively perfect if you know if my life was a movie and there's like one scene and then there's a call back to that scene like one day in the previous shop I had actually had an autistic meltdown in the chair where um uh, there was a friend of theirs who had come in like all the barbers obviously knew him and they'd like mm -hmm. gone drinking with him and he was like came in high energy he was the center of attention like everyone was talking to him and I kind of sort of retreated into myself like feeling really stupid and was like oh i'm never going to be cool enough to to be like that or you know be friends with them like that and i just i i was unusually sad for some reason and kind of went quiet for the rest mm. of the visit and then um a few months later obviously what the new shop and this is my first time seeing that other younger guy for the first time in months and again super nervous beforehand like i was even even texting friends mm. like trying to calm myself down and I, again, just sort of had to embrace it and just kind of went in like all high energy, like being all mad and hugging everyone. And I think I was even playing Power Rangers music for them. <laughs> they, <laughs> there's context, but uh, it'll take which, too long. Which like, series? Which theme? Original, yeah. It was, oh, a, it, was okay. a, it was a cover of the original theme. Go, yeah. go, uh, Power Rangers. Yeah. Yes. And um, yeah, again, like we're all just, everyone was very giddy that day for some reason. And um, at one point I can... I look over and I see like the this guy's client kind of sort of looking at us like who are these crazies yeah. and I realize now it's the other way around now I'm the mad friend coming in with all this <laughs> this thing and again there was the wholesome moment came at the end uh, I'm really gonna stitch this poor guy up um, I basically I hug everyone before I leave you know um, hug my main guy who is like my brother and then the new guy who I haven't met yet and then this guy is um, working still working on this client so I don't want to bother him so I just. Right. Give him a pat on the shoulder to say goodbye and then he turns around and he just sort of like he's like no and leans to the side because he wants the side hug right he's like oh that's cute and yeah i mean i i love that guy as well he's like my little brother and for his uh christmas present this year i actually drew a picture of because uh, he's a he's a big mandalorian fan so i drew right, a picture of him that, yeah picture of him in the armor standing in front of the yellow camaro to represent bumblebee and mm -hmm. that was another thing I was I was afraid to give that picture over and be like, oh God, he'll just Oh think. yeah, stuff like that. It's nerve wracking when you mm -hmm. when you hand make something. It's like mm -hmm. will this be received with the intent that it's given? 
which is really nuts for me to think of because I literally did it the previous year. For, like, I drew a picture of all of them for the whole shop. This was uh, individual pictures. So yeah. I, but it was cool. I went down on a day when it was just him in the shop and uh, uh, he didn't have any clients. So we just sat in the shop and uh, talked for about 40 minutes. And in that, in, that dis- in that winter, it was tough for me to feel positive emotion, but mm-hmm. I felt pretty good afterwards. And like, those guys were basically my my lifeline for so long. And uh, I love them very much. Never would have happened had you not taken that first step and quieted the demons in the head and took a chance. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And... and that's the story we wanted to tell. Bobby Calloway. Check him out. Better with Bob YouTube channel. The videos are great. They are as positive and affirming as this interview has been anything else you're on instagram same uh, uh same yeah um, yeah bobby iceman on twitter instagram and tiktok you know uh any... oh you're on tiktok too i gotta yeah. i gotta go back to tiktok i have i don't i don't use it too TikTok. much i mean yeah. i think the most notable thing i did was a uh, i did a, a comedy sketch as an alcoholic merman for like four years ago yeah yeah, I saved my dancing for the supermarket and you're not allowed to record in there. So I can't do dancing <laughs> videos for TikTok. But if you go to my Instagram, not therapy show on Instagram, you will see Bobby tracks the bizarre things that come out of my mouth in random moments and sends them to me as inspirational phrases. So I can go, I didn't say that. Did I say that? I did say that. Okay, time to go to break. Leanna at Not Therapy Show, nottherapyshow.com. If there's any questions, comments, or concerns on this program, uh, Better With Bob is Bobby's YouTube channel. Again, check that out. Not Therapy Show on social medias. Back in a bit. Final thoughts on how to make connections with others. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back in us a therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. And we're wrapping up this show on making meaningful connections with other people. And writer, filmmaker, online content creator, Bobby Calloway, my friend, was sharing the ways he connects with people through the things he loves in person and through his work. And that's something I think is really important. Just because you're introverted or even shy doesn't mean you can't connect with people. I am very introverted. One of the most powerful connection tools I have, the way I meet people, the way I make friends, is really hyping up the stuff I like sharing things, being honest when something gives me joy. I come on here and YouTube and Twitch. And yeah, I'll honestly say when I don't like something. But if I think something is really cool, I will say that as well. The latest thing, if anybody's wondering, is this anime. I'm watching it on Netflix. It's called Delicious in Dungeon. It's so weird. I love all the characters. They're all kind of creepy cute. And anyway, I've met a lot of really good friends and collaborators that way. Sure, I catch a lot of hate too. But think of it this way. Being critical is safe and easy. A lot of people think, oh, I'm showing how smart I am by criticizing other things. But I don't want to be that guy. Being open about what you like, on the other hand, well, that's more of a risk than criticizing things, right? So if you're really into something and someone goes out of their way to say how terrible it is, that person is letting you know that they're not worth your time. If someone's really, really excited about something, that's kind of infectious. I got a thing lately, screaming pug videos. I don't know why these things make me laugh, guaranteed. There's another thing, someone's done this computer thing where it's Donald Duck singing the Let It Go song from Frozen, you know, like, let it go, let it go, that, but it's like, Donald is just going. And I cannot watch this thing without laughing so hard I cry. You can learn a lot by someone sharing in the stuff they like without judgment. Do not judge me for the fact that 
Donald Duck singing Let It Go from Frozen just makes me laugh. You know, don't judge. What does a person like about the stuff they like? Why is it so meaningful to them? When you have those conversations, the core value sharing, those elements that are integral to forming really, really solid bonds with people, they start coming into the conversation effortlessly, especially when talking to men. Trust me, people who are not men, it's way easier to get a guy talking about what he likes about Mace Windu from Star Wars than getting him to talk about his feelings. Why did I pick Mace Windu? I have no idea. I think Mace Windu is cool. So you learned something about me. Parents of teenagers listening, don't crap on the stuff they like, even if you think it's crap. You may think their favorite video game is hot garbage. But if you voice that, they're less likely to share with you. You're not going to convince them to not like it. You're just going to convince them that you don't understand them and you're not listening because you don't understand them and you're not listening. Top 10 phrase, listen twice before you talk once. If they bring up something they like and you just go, oh, why do you like that stuff? Why would they share that with you? Why are you dumping on the things people like. You can't form connections with other people without knowing how to listen. All you are doing, boys, ah, that's garbage. What do you do that? You're, you're showing you're emotionally fragile and you're stunted and you're a jerk. Instead, learn how to listen. Really listen. No, really, really listen. Not just wait to talk. Not just look for things to criticize. Not to solve someone's problems. Really listen to understand. The example you set is way more powerful than the advice you give. You have to give of yourself. You have to support and show yourself. If you ever really want to feel accepted. And and yeah, giving of yourself, showing who you really are, that means a lot of rejection. It means criticism, and that hurts. And if you're surrounded by people who leap to tell you what you did wrong when you're feeling stung, or worse, encourage you to give up, if they don't stop when you say that's not helping, are those people really helping you be your best self? We can't spend our whole lives hiding from pain and pretending to be perfect. Top 10 phrase, perfect is a lie. Stop trying to be perfect. When we mess up, When we fall on our faces, it gives people the chance to care about us in a deeper way. If you show people you're crazy, then you'll eventually find people who love you for the crazy, amazing person you are. And remember, you're crazy is only a problem if it's hurting you. See you next week.